I'm Mark Rexler with The Climatographers. Given my interest in carbon offsets and biodiversity, for that matter, I was intrigued by this headline when I saw it cross my desk. UN says new biodiversity credits can succeed where carbon offsets failed. And so I dug into the article, I dug into the paper underlying the article, and I wanted to provide a little bit of context that I thought might be useful. Two important points. One is that some people use the term credit and offset interchangeably, and that's not the case with this paper. Even though this news piece refers to carbon credits when they mean carbon offsets. So it all gets quite confusing. And even though some of the nomenclature is the same, so for example, they talk about the additionality of biodiversity credits, that has nothing to do with additionality as normally applied to carbon offsets. So it gets pretty confusing pretty quickly, but let's dig in to the larger topic for one second of biodiversity offsets, and then the specific paper that's being referred to here. As you're probably aware, the topic of biodiversity offsets has been growing in importance. It's been talked about for a decade, but there's been a lot more discussion of it in recent years, and it's already quite contentious. We have a lot of material on the topic covered in the climate web, this is a dashboard with material that we think is probably the most useful for rapidly coming up to speed on the subject of biodiversity offsets. And it points you to a bunch of different reports, a bunch of news stories, a bunch of websites, several videos. So a lot that you can dig into if you want to come up to speed on the topic of biodiversity offsets. One paper that you'll see here is 2022 Ducros, Biodiversity Credits to Finance Nature and people. And I'm going to jump over to that and quickly walk through that because that's the paper that was referred to in the Bloomberg piece that we started out with. So this is a new paper that just came out, authors Anna Ducros, Paul Steele, published by IIED and by UNDP. It's a short paper, 27 pages. We can run through it pretty quickly. And it makes some key points. First, that Biocredits can generate the private and public finance needed to close the financing gap for inclusive nature outcomes to protect 30% of the world's terrestrial and marine habitats by 2030. So that's a big claim for the idea of biodiversity credits. A really important point here is that they specifically differentiate between biodiversity credits and biodiversity offsets. In fact, they throw biodiversity offsets under the bus noting that biocredits are a purely positive investment in nature. They're distinct and are preferred to biodiversity offsets, which can cause net damage to biodiversity. And biocredits supplied by indigenous peoples and local communities can create an innovative way to fund locally led action. And I'll get a little more into the differences of the two in just a minute. So chapter one of the report walks through the definitions and the differentiation between offsets and credits. It notes that there are several kinds of biocredits, avoided loss, restoration, and even supporting existing efforts, biocredits. And a key point that they make where biodiversity offsets become more analogous to carbon offsets is that biodiversity offsets are based on the idea of equivalence in the sense of you're getting rid of some biodiversity in one place, you're protecting biodiversity in another place, there should be some equivalence, which is exactly the same idea that comes up with carbon offsets. And what they're saying is that biocredits are not based on equivalence. They're simply doing good and they should not be used as offsets. What's a lot less clear is why companies are going to buy a lot of these biocredits if they can't use them as biodiversity offsets. In a very real sense, these biocredits are much more analogous to what's being discussed as carbon contribution claims in the carbon market, which are specifically not offsets, but all you're doing is giving money to good causes that are doing good things for climate change. That's really what you're doing here with the biocredits. It's been very hard to get companies in the carbon space to buy carbon contributions claims since they can't use them 
as offsets, they can't use them towards net zero commitments. Why would the biodiversity space be much different? Now let's take a look at chapter two, where they get into the challenges. Two key points here. One, they make the point that for the market to function, there must be clear metrics for what a biodiversity credit is, even though the different organizations getting involved in the biocredit market use different ways of defining their biocredits and different metrics. There's also this note in terms of what additionality means. So additionality means increasing the amount of finance. Additionality means increasing the strength of relevant institutions with some of the money, or it can mean altering the distribution of financial compensation for conservation. So very different from the idea of additionality in carbon markets, where the definition is this project, is this outcome attributable to the existence of the carbon offset market. And that is specifically not being asked for biocredits. So jumping back up to the main report entry, and I'm not gonna go in, in detail, chapter three reviews several of the existing biocredit schemes. Chapter four eval evaluates how those schemes are doing. Chapter five provides some recommendations. And so the bottom line is that you've gotta remember that these biodiversity credits are very different from biodiversity offsets and they're very different from carbon offsets. And it would be great if companies want to go in and buy a lot of these bio credits and provide large amounts of revenue for nature-based investments. Just not totally clear to me why they would want to do that. Hope that brief profile is useful. Thanks for watching.